Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. It's so great to have you here in 2019. As we kick off the year this uh, this week, we're going to be looking at how to rip episodic DVDs. So if you got some DVD sets in your stocking this week, uh, this, this year, um, then you're going to be able to copy those to your Plex Media server, for example. We're going to talk all about it. We're going to show you how to do it and uh, and why. I think we should also talk about our favorite moments from 2018. We Cat definitely Boy. should reminisce. Yes. I think that'll be coming up too. <laughs> Stick around. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, Plex, and other HLS video players. For local show times, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. Happy New Year to all. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us uh, this week again. Uh, this feels like the first time we've been live uh, in a while because uh, we had last week technically off, That's uh, right. which was a unique experience. We don't normally do that. So not hope, often. Hope everybody enjoyed uh, the, the Christmas musical. <laughs> Loads I of fun. I meant to watch it, and I forgot. Isn't it funny how when? Uh, well, I mean, it was it was Boxing Day, right? When it went to air, and uh, I was I had about thirty people in my house. I had created a turkey dinner, and yeah. I was serving it up. And we were just about to sit down for dessert when uh, when the show went up. Yeah. So, uh, so Very I did stop cool. into the chat room, just say hi, and mm -hmm. I did see you pop in and say, yeah. "Oh, it's showtime!" Ah. Ah. I didn't watch. I hope that you had a wonderful Christmas and a wonderful um, New Year, and and you know, here's to the the greatest year ever, 2019. It's oh, going to yeah. be a good one. Um, looking back on 2018. Do we have any favorite moments moments here at Category 5 TV that you guys can think of? And I'd encourage you to think of the same and comment below your favorite moments of 2018 here on Category 5 TV. Which one of you is this first? I will go first. I would right. say right off the hop. Right I would say Marshman's guest appearance and my... Driving eight hours... Yes to join us here in our Canadian studio. And meeting the marvelous Mrs. Marshman. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely amazing. top of my list as well. Yes. Yeah. That, that's my number one. I wasn't here. You weren't here. You were, you were off I gallivanting was, in the woods. Yes, I was. What, I was freezing my butt off. What favorite moments of 2018 do you have here at the studio? Uh, I think I have two that are tied for first. Okay. Uh, the first one that popped my mind was the blockchain interview we did with Robert uh, Koenig. Mm -hmm. I love that interview that totally changed my knowledge of the blockchain, took me to the next level of amateurness. And, <laughs> uh, and I was like, hey, I'm not just a newbie anymore. I'm an amateur. Perfect. And I've taken some of that knowledge from the interview and I've had conversations with people. Even at Christmas, yeah. we got talking about the blockchain with my family uh -huh. and uh, you know, talking about other uses for the blockchain, not just cryptocurrency, because I'm like, oh, it's cryptocurrency, it's that Bitcoin stuff. Right. I'm like, no, there's other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then when I started explaining to them and you know, the idea of like produce and not having all these recalls, and you know, then my, when I raised the question to them about uh, why not use it for passports, they're going, oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, we could totally, yes, I like that. And I was like, I sold my family on the blockchain. It's Perfect. Amazing. And they're not We are people. thick with knowledge. And I know, we had we had a lot of great interviews, a lot of great presentations here on Category 5 uh, over the past year. Uh, that's definitely a highlight for me as well. And having Robert back a couple of times. And we're going to see him again in, uh, in 2019 Sweet. as our crypto correspondent as well. I have to say, one of my key points of 2018, not to do so much with the show, but um, just thinking of how the community viewers and even our local community have come together to support us. And I think about how an anonymous viewer sent us a Ninja Flame video right. recorder to supplement our entire broadcast process. And now the video quality is better mm -hmm. because of that. And we're able to do so much more. And how our local uh, music pro, the music store in town, has 
gratis loaned us wireless microphones so now we're moving around the studio and it's changed the show it has absolutely <laughs> changed and and now we're i'm thinking about how okay we can set up a set over there and we can just walk over and just turn the camera and we can do this and that mm -hmm. it's so much more freedom for us and and so just having community come together um both our community on the show and the community here locally um supporting category five has been something that uh, you know that's a big highlight right. for me can I add to that? And it's the same line, but switching to Discord for me. Yes. Huge for, for community. Like I feel, and I mean, I feel surrounded by friends all of the time now. For example, when I was doing the OS on my computer. Yes. Right? And I was sitting there th thinking for an iota of a second, I could do this alone. <laughs> <laughs> and then Garby popped in and, and between the two of us, M mostly Garvey. <laughs> I managed to install a new OS on my computer, mm -hmm. which I don't have on me right now, but mm -hmm. that wouldn't have happened without Discord. And it cool. wouldn't have happened think. when you used the book face either. Because you'd right. have to put right. status up to be like, ah, oh, what I do? Mm -hmm. and people like, hashtag like. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and for those of you who are, well, what's this Discord that she's talking about? If you look over there, just past Jeff, you see what looks like a chat room. And that's our Discord server. So you can join that through our website. Um, and there's, there, there are links on the Interact menu. But what I love about that is you say switching to Discord. More like we've supplemented our community with Discord. Yes. Mm -hmm. IRC is still active. I see the Foo there, and the Foo, it's nice to see you. Um, the Foo is, in fact, communicating on Discord via our old IRC chat room. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're actually in IRC, the old way of doing things. So we haven't right. replaced that. True. We've supplemented it, made a bridge, and I wrote some code to be able to communicate between those two servers, and it's now one great community. And it's really helped to grow our community and the ability to communicate throughout the week and, and, well, and really that, has improved things that I way. That's what I really noticed is because mm -hmm. before with the chat room, you know, it would be active during the show. There'd be a few people throughout the week, but now Discord's up and people are on all the time. Yes. It's yeah. awesome. It's great. GWG has taken offense to the fact that I call IRC the old way, but to be fair, it was. I used IRC when I was about this big. I had a full head of hair. IRC was before social media. I had MIRC and yeah. that was the application that I used. Yep. I mean, it is old school, you got to admit. And now, you know, we just we've been able to bridge that and make it make the community even better. Jeff, any other fond memories of 2018? Um with Cat 5? Yes. The STEM specifically. Show, STEM show with my daughter. Ah, uh, yes. I loved doing that. It that was was, cool. was that in 2018? That yeah. was in 2018. Wow. That was episode 548. It was uh, like springish March, April, mm -hmm. I believe. No, that would have been 2017. No, I looked it up earlier. Really? Yeah, I went through the show. show oh, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. Thank you. I we got that recorded. <laughs> I was right. No, I had it mixed up with because I was trying to remember when we had the kids on the show, oh, and I was oh, thinking yes. of our our March break special that we did in 2017. In 2017 yes. Because she was on that as well. Yes. So but no, no, that was, was that was her boombox. Now this was, was right. when she had the uh, the, the gen doll. The gen doll. Yeah, from um, Smart Girls. Yes. And the fact that she was coding on it, she still plays with it. Awesome. I love it. Nice. And it was so much fun watching her just pick it up. Use it on the tablet and start coding. Yeah. And she did such minutes. a great job. That's she did cool. a phenomenal job. And now since that time, she's done commercials on Facebook. Nice. Got that girl. Way to go, kiddo. Life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another fond memory for me, Jeff. This was with you and I on the air. We did a review of the Edifier <laughs> R1210T speakers. Yes. Your hair. Moved my hair. Your hair. Yeah. The, the bass from these speakers <laughs> made his was, hair it blow. Like full-blown Trump. <laughs> it it amazing. amazing. That was, that that was a highlight cool. for me. Yeah, that was that great. That was good. Also musically, mm -hmm. uh, the rap with Shizu. Hey, yes. When we did the microphone. That was fun. Amazing. And got a great response on YouTube, surprisingly. <laughs> YouTube's usually really hard on us, but no, it was all thumbs up. It's because you let two girls talk. Oh, there you go. That's what it was. I have to say, though, I think I have the most fun, though, with viewer questions. Yes. Those are always, like, solid shows for me. Mm -hmm. Yes. They'll always be a highlight. I love the viewer questions. I enjoyed um, learning to solder. 
Yes. <laughs> oh, and the way, again, yes. going back to our community, <laughs> how the community made fun of me, but in a constructive criticism kind of way right. to help me to learn more and more to do a better job at soldering. So now I understand more about how it works. Right. I know what the rosin does and I know how I'm, I'm much, much better at it. I'm still not a great solderer, <laughs> but I'm learning and the community <laughs> really helped me with that. Mm -hmm. yep. Any other highlights for you? Um, well, when we did the retro pie, yes, that was on my episode. list. Oh yes. yes, I wasn't here, but I love watching it. Nice. And then, well, and then that followed up with doing the Odroid Go with Marshman. The handheld, the yes, handheld, mm -hmm. which again, like that that line of idea for retro gaming for me. Like that episode, yep. and then this next episode, which and is going to catapult me because I got one for Dave for Christmas. Oh, fantastic. Ooh. And so I haven't assembled it or brought it to you for help. <laughs> 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 but it's like the next step for me, which is great. Add to my Yeah, collection. that's awesome. And, and those are both examples of STEM mm -hmm. and projects that we did ourselves, right. that you participated in, that we actually built retro gaming stuff exactly from a handheld to an actual retro pie which is like you think about classic nintendo games and classic sega genesis games and all those kinds of things on a raspberry pie and we built that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i do and think it it's funny you've gone from like uber beefed up vr to handheld retro game. Yeah. Speaking it's of like VR, it's the whole spectrum. The it's the whole spectrum. I did get my VR in 2018. Nice. So that didn't was, happen on no. the show. We need to yeah. get it on the show. We need to get it on the show. Yeah, I got my computer. I built the computer in 2017. Did a right news at the tail story. End. Right. Did a news story about the VR and like, and then got my tax return and spent it immediately. <laughs> <I forgot. laughs> That's right. You did. Oh it was, boy. It was the rift you got. Um. Yes. Yes, the, VR, the Oculus Rift. Yeah. No, yeah. no. The, um, why can't Vive? Vive. Oh, you got the Vive? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. That's right. Yes. Um, what is the name? Another thing that I really enjoyed and, and thinking of the, the retro pie and just all of the single board computers that we've had on the show, lots of unboxings, lots of reviews. We've done the giggle scores. <laughs> Love the giggle yeah. scores. Oh, and, yeah. and we're learning how each of these single board computers performs against one another, which to me is exciting because up until a year and a half ago, realistically, there was just Raspberry Pi. Yeah. There were other boards out there, but really... In the market, there was just the Raspberry Pi. And now there are so many much more powerful single board computers mm -hmm. to the point where we're, we're probably a couple of iterations away from being able to use one as a desktop computer. Oh, and, totally and that has been a real highlight for me. Yep. Any cool. final thoughts on 2018? I know of one that, well, it may have been end of 2017 but I, but I do it comes to mind because we're talking about VR and everything but it, and I think it still counts because it's in my mind it's within the okay. past yeah, year yeah. and a bit okay but we did tour the Starship Enterprise that is true we yes, did yes that was 2017 2017 yes. yep. mm -hmm. yeah. so a little off on my timing Ooh. but in my heart, it, it, it comes back to me every day. And, and I, I think it's fresh to me because Stage 9 was shut down by CBS. And so, you know, I, it, it's still a part of my 2018. Right. Being right. able to live that boyhood fantasy of standing on the Starship Enterprise and traveling around, walking around True. on the Starship. Do we have time for one more? One more. Okay. So remember we did the review of those tablets and then Jeff brought in the yes. boogie board sink and yep. then I bought a boogie board sink and then I dropped it on the floor. Mm. And then did you get it fixed? Well, and then I kept saying that I would call them. Well, today on my lunch break, I called them. Yes. Talked to a guy named Chris. And explained hi, Chris. the whole situation. Hi, Chris. Um, yeah, he was like, yeah, it sounds sincere, and that is a problem with our case. It actually is an open corner. Just uh, when you have your sink with you, because I was calling from work and I didn't have it with me, because mm. it doesn't work right now. Um, he's like, just uh, read off the 
I guess, product ID to me, and I'll just send you a new one. He's just like straight up sending me a new one. Yes! I know. Yes! I know. Did you even have to play the I'm said, Sasha Rickman card? No, but wow. I said, I'm going to mention you on the show tonight. Oh, and fantastic. Now, when Chris, I call him. You're the man. Yeah. See, that's the kind of tech support that, love it. that yeah. we need in this world. And companies that stand by their products like that, even when admittedly it was your fault. It was fault. my fault. I said, I, I'm like, I tried to protect this thing against me. I bought mm -hmm. a case. It didn't work. Right. And he said, we're working on that. So it's a known flaw yeah. in their protective case. Yeah. Because truly, if you buy the additional component of the protection that is supposed to save it from drops. Right. Except and it that doesn't actually save it from drops. Exactly. It's not Sasha proof. It's not Sasha proof. I, I really should be just a walking commercial for <laughs> <laughs> how to... It, it makes sense to me, though. I mean, there's two sides to that. But if I bought a waterproof case... Right. And then I submerged my thing, and it leaked, and it got destroyed, then I would expect that... Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Proper tech support would say, yeah, we'll send you another one. Yeah. That's a flaw. So, so that's good. That's I'm getting very a new good. one. Thank you, Chris. That's awesome. Awesome. Okay, so tonight uh, we've got a fantastic show planned for you. We're going to be, yeah, we're going to be learning how to rip episodic DVDs, which I'm really excited about. This is something mm. that we've really needed to do because the questions keep coming up on YouTube. Recently, I feel like we've done this in the past, have we not? No. Really? Yeah. Huh. We've, we've learned about ripping DVDs, and some of what we're going to learn tonight is Maybe redundant to that. But a lot of questions stem from that video, and those are what we're going to set out to answer okay. tonight. And, and uh, admittedly, several years have gone by since Kelsey and I did that did review. That was, yeah, yeah, that was a long time absolutely. ago. Absolutely. Um, recently, I removed elementary OS from my work computer. So mm -hmm. my production computer where I do all my programming, I ripped it out of there, and I took the step, and I installed Linux Mint. Oh. Latest and greatest version. Um, you know that I was impressed with Linux Mint here on the show. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, I'm a Debian guy, but I, I do like the ease of the Ubuntu architecture and the, the infrastructure that they've created. Um, and so Linux Mint was really a nice step away from Ubuntu's interface mm -hmm. while still giving me the feel of like the Mate. I'm using Cinnamon, but that, that kind of, uh, I, I don't want to say retro, but... I like that paradigm mm -hmm. of like a start menu, if you will. In, yeah, in right. Linux, it's the applications menu. Or, you know, it just feels more the way that I'm used to using a computer. So I've been using that for several weeks now, and I found that Linux Mint is really, uh, it performs great. It works better than Elementary did on my system. I have a, a brutally awesome system, 96 gigs of RAM, 24 cores, two Xeon processors. So How much did that run you? Well, this is work. my production system at work. Oh so <laughs> running Linux on it is just a no-brainer. And, right. and, but then I've got three screens in front of me, and elementary, and they finally fixed this after I'd been running it for so long. But y you can't drag things from one monitor to the other without this massive gap in between the screens. So there was oh. this like, ridiculous gap between the oh. screens and you couldn't fix it. And the reasoning was because some of my, two, two of my monitors are horizontal, the one in the middle is turned vertical. Okay. So because of that vertical, it was completely messed up. Uh. Needless to say, Linux Mint, out of the box, worked flawlessly. Installing the NVIDIA drivers, flawless. Um, and, and just operating it over the past three, four weeks has been brilliant. So, if, so I say that, you know, in my production environment, with everything that I do, at work, it's all done now on Linux Mint. And if you're looking for a Linux distro, I, I think that it's one that is definitely, um, you know, up there. Um, and that's one that I think that, uh, uh, yeah, I'm pleased with that, with that transition, for Ooh, sure. That is cool. Mm -hmm. okay. We've tried so many different Linux distros. Not to say any are, you know, the... It's kind of personal you know, choice, really. Yeah, it really is. With Linux, it's, it's a, they're flavors. You mm -hmm. try the one, you know, that works for you. And that one right now is working for me. You like the mint, huh? I do. <laughs> I never used to. I never used to. I do now. Uh, they've come a long way. Um, just quickly before we take a, a short break, I just want to say thank you to all of our patrons who have been supporting Category yes. 5 TV. Um, you can check out more at uh, patreon.com slash Category 5. It's a great way to support Category 5 TV. This is free, family-friendly episodes of tech TV every single week. And we do more than just tech. 
You recognize Jeff from New Every Day. It's a faith broadcast that we bro uh, that we uh, share with you every single week. Uh, we have we we're getting back into the pixel shadow and doing some video oh, gaming. Cool. Um, there's there's so much great content there, but definitely the episodic um, week to week of Category Five Technology TV is uh, that's our flagship show, mm -hmm. and uh, it's always you know we we try to make this as as accessible and family friendly, and free. And it's thanks to our patrons and those who support Category 5 that we're able to do that. Um, so we thank you for that. Again, uh, patreon.com slash Category 5. And with, you know, wrapping up the Christmas season, the shopping season, thank you to everyone who used our partner links as ah. well to do your shopping. Um, throughout the year, you know, it's not just a Christmas thing, but um, throughout the year, if you're going to be shopping online, go to our website, category5.tv, click on support us, and you'll see our partner uh, links. And there you're able to shop through our partners, Amazon, eBay, all the different stores you can think of, Think Geek, um, Gearbest, yeah. There's a ton on there, and and other partners that that we love and uh, and and support as well. And they give us a commission on the sales. So all you have to do is just go through our website, and that's a great way to support us as well. So that we can really be strong in 2019. I want to see Category Five grow, and we are growing to the point where we had trouble with one of our servers today because our MySQL server was completely capped out. Really? There were so many requests on the server. So you wow. know these are things that we deal with here. Want to be able to have the resources in place to be able to grow um, at the same rate as our viewing audience, mm -hmm. which can be tough when you give it away for free. So for those of you who support us, thank you. For those of you who have considered supporting us and you haven't yet, please uh, follow those links. And uh, those are some great ways to support us or just message our community and they'll share some other ways to, uh, to become a part of it as well. We do have to take a quick, quick break. When we come back, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at episodic DVD rips. So stick around. Whether you shop on ThinkGeek, GearBest, B&H Photo Video, eBay, or Amazon, or even if you want a free trial of Audible, You'll find the best deals and support the shows we produce by simply visiting the shopping sites you already frequent by using the links on our website. Visit category5.tv slash partners for the full and ever-growing list and help us create more free content like this show. Thank you for shopping with our partners and thank you for watching. Just before the break, uh, we had Discord up there, and we were even talking about Discord. I know. But it was frozen. Didn't realize. Hopefully, it's going to work out a little better. I mean, it's it's just the positioning of the moon on this, the first week it's of a, it's a January cool of 2019. It, it is. is very That's cool. That's why it froze. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think we've got everything going. Somebody say something, just to be sure. Garby's laughing. This week... We are going to be kind of reapproaching an old topic. Now, mm -hmm. on our YouTube channel, there's a hot video about ripping copy protected DVDs. Mm -hmm. And this week, we are going to be readdressing that because there are a few questions that frequently come in on that YouTube um, video. Mm -hmm. Things around I essentially episodic DVD rips. Okay. Now, when you rip a DVD, if it's a movie, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward right. because it's one video and you're ripping it and encoding it and, and decoding it and, and everything else. But it's one video. Now, when you get a DVD set of your favorite shows, mm -hmm. it is a little more challenging because typically each disc has multiple episodes on it. Right. So there is a, an added challenge to that. So tonight we're going to look at software that we have looked at before, but we're going to take a little bit of a different approach because we are going to be using an episodic DVD set in order to do our rips. Okay, then. All right. The process, just so you know, if you are interested in only in ripping movies and not episodic DVDs, the process is the same. Okay. If you master this, you will absolutely master the ability to rip movies as well, because as I say, it's just one video on the disc, typically. Would the same process for an episodic TV show work the same as, say, like a DVD that's got special content, 
you yeah. know, interviews and mm -hmm. stuff? Absolutely. Okay. Those are other videos on the discs. Yeah. So okay. quickly, because I know one of, the, one of the comments on YouTube is, I talk too much. <laughs> and so I want to just quickly mention that one of the reasons I would want to do this, and one of the reasons I want to do this, has nothing to do with the technology, but it has to do with the fact that I watch a lot of uh, British shows. Right. So they come to me, when I order them off of Amazon.co.uk, they come to me region coded to the UK, so they don't play in a local oh, Canadian okay. DVD player. Right. Oh, so I have okay. to rip it in order to be able to watch it on my TV, because it's region coded. Okay. That makes sense. See, and for me, I like this because I have a ton of DVDs, but we're looking at getting a new sound system right. that they don't have DVD players anymore. Yeah, yeah. And all of our TVs are connected to Plex. So I want to be able to watch stuff. Exactly. You, you may have a Blu-ray player, which plays DVDs as well, right. but a lot of us have multimedia centers. And that's the other comment that comes in on our YouTube channel is, well, why would I want to rip things to a computer so that I can watch them on my laptop? No, this can, th these files can be watched on smart TVs, on mm -hmm. set-top boxes, on... I have a computer in my cellar that has an HDMI cable coming out of it to the back of a 55-inch TV, and that's our system. So uh, that's how we watch our TV from Plex. So right. I put them on my Plex media server, and then we watch the shows up on our big screen TV. So th this is not just so you can watch it in a portable means of taking it with you on, on a laptop, mm -hmm. though that is one good use case too. If your kids are going away to school and they have a bunch of DVDs, they might not be able to take them all with them, yes. but you can rip them to their hard drive and then all of a sudden they've got their entire library and are able to take that to school with them, just as an example. For the record, we're not breaking any laws here tonight. No. We own the DVDs that we are ripping. Um, this is about making your content that you already own more accessible on your devices. Yep. Perfect. I don't own a DVD player. I think I own a DVD player, but I think it's somewhere in the garage. It's not okay. connected to any of my devices, right. especially with the advent of flat screen TVs. I no longer have a cabinet with DVD players and VCRs and things, and I don't want to have it sitting on the floor below the TV that's mounted on the wall. So it's just a different world, but I own the content. And in fact, this is a, a show that I, I bought for my wife, but technically for my wife and I to enjoy yes. together. <laughs> Inspector Lewis, it's a great um, murder mystery show if you haven't seen it, um, from PBS. And, and it is, what, uh, nine seasons on wow. 18 discs. 18 DVDs. That's crazy. Right? So this is something that I want to be on my Plex Media server because mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have a DVD player to put <laughs> the DVDs in. So why are we ripping DVDs and not Blu-rays? Uh, size? Because... No, because I can compress them. Not okay. everything plays a Blu-ray. But if I rip it to a file, then, then it, it would play. Then it would be fine. Right. Right. So. It's, it's a valid question, and this is another one that you've been sending in. Uh, the best answer I can give you for that is let's just think about the technology for just one moment. Now, Blu-ray, you would say, is it's better quality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can get 1080p Blu-ray, 4K Blu-ray. These are only 480p. Granted, they oh. still look great, but DVD is much less quality than Blu-ray. That's right. why Blu-ray is the, you know, the current optical standard anyways. Think about your computer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have a DVD drive? On my computer? I yeah, you do? Yep. Do you have a Blu-ray drive? No. No. Mm -hmm. So think about mm. when, you, when you buy a computer, mm -hmm. even when you build a computer, hmm. your computer has DVD capabilities. Right. But we may not right. necessarily okay. use it um, to its full capacity. A lot of us use it, to, you know, sometimes to burn discs and things like that. Mm -hmm. But most computers, I, I don't want to be so general, but a majority of computers will not have Blu-ray drives. So you cannot rip Blu-ray on a DVD drive. You can rip DVD and every computer since years ago has DVD if it has an optical drive. Right. Right? There was CD, then DVD, and every computer has it. Blu-ray was never adopted as a computer standard. You can spend extra money, you can buy extra devices to, can, to give yourself Blu-ray, but I imagine that if you've done that, you already know what you're doing and you've, you already know how to rip because why would you spend the extra hundreds of dollars on an upgrade for your computer that you, when you don't even know what it does? Right. It's not, so the, the drive that is built into your computer and in my laptop today is DVD. 
that's all it will read. Okay. Uh, and, and CD. It's yep. downward compatible. But it will not do Blu-ray. So that's the answer to that. Um, and, w and the other point about that is that we're doing this for free. Right. Yes. Because I, huge. I already have the hardware, the DVD drive in my laptop. I already have the, well, I'm going to have the software in about five minutes. I'm going to show you how to get it. It's absolutely free. If I wanted to rip Blu-ray, I have to invest in new hardware. I have to buy commercial software. True story. Um, I, I have to go through all those hoops. So we're not going there. It's all about the DVD. All right. So the product that we're going to be using is called Handbrake. And I do have the capability of bringing this up on my screen. So I'm just going to do that for you. Um, let's go. Handbrake. Dot fr. Now, this software is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it's absolutely free. I'm going to do the demonstration on Windows 10 tonight. Um, so I've just clicked on the download button, and it asked me, do I want to keep it? And yes, I want to keep that file. So now it's downloading this 12 megabyte file. It's going to be here in 10 seconds. Here we go. 12 megabytes. So huge. Super tiny. <laughs> so this is a program that's going to allow us to copy these DVDs to a file. Right. So understand we're not making a copy from a DVD to another DVD. No, right. we're we're taking the data off of the DVD, we're going to remove the copy protection, and we're going to then encode it to a file format, MP4, mm -hmm. which is going to allow us to watch it on our set-top box, on our Plex Media server, all of those things. Okay, so you said remove the copy protection. Yes. Now, do we eventually put copy protection back on? Mm -mm. Okay, so should most uh, systems that have DRM protection I think that D DRM, DCM? Yeah, DRM. DRM. Mm -hmm. Would they still recognize it without the copy protection? Okay, so understand, Jeff, we're not going to change the DVD. Correct. Okay? Yeah. DVDs are a read-only medium. Right. DVD RW, that's different. That means rewrite. Right. Okay? But when you buy a, a commercial DVD video set, it is uh, read-only. Right. They've silk screened it and pressed it. Um, so we're not making any changes that are going to affect that disk. It's going to still work exactly the same. It's going to have the same copy protection. What we're doing is when we copy it to the hard drive of my computer, we're going to remove the, the protection which will obfuscate the video. Okay. Because if I just simply, if I just put a DVD in my drive and copied all the files to my computer and tried to play the VOB files, they'd be green lines yes. and it would be all messed up because mm -hmm. there's copy protection that prevents me from making that copy. Right. Okay? And rightly so, I go back to the fact that I own these discs. I'm not showing you how to bootleg or how to make illegal copies. Yeah, don't do that. What we're doing here is, is just making this for ourselves. So with that file now downloaded, I hope that answers your question. It does. Right? Okay. So there's Handbrake now ready to install. So I'm going to click on that, and we're going to install that. Next, I agree, and next. Perfect. Now you think you're done, but you're not. I mentioned about copy protection. Yes. Okay. Right. Handbrake mm -hmm. is free software, and they need to be careful that they are not distributing software that can be used for illegal purposes. Okay. Right? So right now in its current state, I can rip my family movies. I can rip my wedding DVD that was created for me. Right. But I cannot rip commercial DVDs with copy protection. Right. I have to go one step further in order to rip and decode the copy protection, remove that. And that's using a tool from VLC which okay. we all know and love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. VLC, the video player, it's able to play everything, and we can use some of their technology in order to bypass and get around the copy okay. protection. Okay? Oh, neat. So it's a little hard to find. When I go to VLC dot, is it org? Nope. VLC, let's just, no, now it's in my memory. VLC dot, no, videoland.org. That's how they always get me. Okay, videoland.org in projects, you see libdvdcss, and it gives you all these. Now, libdvdcss is specifically a library designed for accessing DVDs like a block device without having to bother about the decryption. It's a fancy way to say this gets around the encoding that protects the DVD. You can go into releases. 
and you can go into 1.2.12, and then you see Win64. See all the hoops that you got to go through? What, no, why that version? Did they discontinue it after they that? They stopped or? making it for, they stopped oh, okay. compiling it for Windows. Oh, okay. So that particular version, 1.2.12, Anyways, you're on Windows. Let's make it simple. I've created a hot link for you. All you oh. have to do is go cat5.tv slash libdvdcss. Forget about the .dll because it's just a hot link. When I click on that, enter, it's going to redirect to the file and it's going to allow me to download it Perfect. and keep. What was it again? cat5.tv slash lib. Uh, DVD, DVD CSS, lib DVD CSS, and you see that below as well. Cool. So now I've downloaded that file. Just save it to your downloads folder. I cannot reiterate enough. You do not save this to its final destination. Your Windows system won't allow you to do that, and it will end up saving it in the wrong spot, and then your decoding will not work. Okay. Okay? I need to now take that DLL file, which has been downloaded to my downloads folder, um, and I actually, I've downloaded it twice, so it's got a, a one after it. I want the, uh, the original DLL file. So I just want to copy that file, libdvd css-2.dll is what it's calling it right now. And I'm going to go, now again, I'm on Windows. This will work on Mac and Linux. It's just that the file locations are different. Find where um, Handbrake installed to and you'll be able to do this. On Windows, it's usually going to be in your C drive in program files and then a folder now called Handbrake because remember, I installed a program called Handbrake. So here it is, but it's missing the DLL to decode that. So I'm going to right click and hit paste and here's the warning. You're going to need administrator permission to do this. Continue. So now in that folder, along with my handbrake.exe, is also libdvdcss-2.dll. That is a necessary step. If you're getting garbled video on your rips, you've, you've done that incorrectly. Okay. okay. Download it to your downloads folder, then copy it or cut it and paste it into the same folder as handbrake.exe do not open the program before that point, okay? Notice the, the steps that we've taken. Now I can close this and I'm gonna bring up Handbrake on my screen and I've, I've already inserted the first disk of the set, okay? okay? Do that first, put your disk in. If you bring up Handbrake first and then put the disk in, you're probably not gonna see your, your disk. Okay. Put it in first, okay? Now I'm gonna bring up Handbrake. Here it comes. And you see now it has detected the DVD. So hit OK, uh, or just click on that DVD. And now it's scanning the titles of this disc. Now, on the box set here, mm -hmm. there's a couple of things. So on the back of the disc, on the case, right. disc one. OK. And then there's the pilot. And Series then pilot and... Whom the gods would destroy. Two episodes. Two episodes. One disc. Two episodes. Yeah. So on that disc now, I can see, if I look under title, I see three files. Well, what, what on earth, right? Observe. One hour, 37 minutes and four seconds. One hour, 38 minutes and 38 seconds. One minute, 39 seconds. That's the episode. <laughs> ah. So the first two files, uh, the first two um, titles that it sees on the DVD, those are the episodes. And then this is probably the menu. Right. Right. It's like a one minute loop. Um, so I'm going to first click on the first one and up here, see this here? This is extremely important. I need to observe how they created this DVD, the encoding that they used. Mm -hmm. So this is 720 by 480, but it is actually anamorphic. So it's 853 by 480 mm -hmm. is the actual resolution of the disc. And this is key, the frame rate. 23.98 frames per second. Keep that in the back of your mind. So I want to, you notice that it defaulted to fast 1080p 30? Yep. Don't want that. Okay. Because a DVD is only 480p. Why would I rip it in 1080p, which will upscale, it will create a 1080p file, but the source is only 480p. So right, I'm so basically just stretching it out. Yeah. Right. It would just make a bigger file. Yeah. Uselessly. Yeah. So what I want to do is I want to, as closely as possible, match my encoders to the DVD itself. That's right. why the frame rate is very, very important. So the first thing I'm going to do with the DVD is I'm going to change my preset to general fast 480p 30, because that's the closest thing to match a DVD, 480p 30 seconds 
uh, 30 frames per second. So next thing I want to do is turn on web optimized. What that will do, Jeff, is that will help so that your Plex Media server, if you pause it, it can resume easier. Okay. If you skim, it, you can skim easier because right. it's in your web okay. browser when you're using Plex. Um, so that helps. Web optimized is important. Dimensions, I just want to bring you back to this. We don't need to change anything. It's already detected. 720 by 480. Anamorphic is set to automatic, and you see that the display size is coming out to 853 by 480, which matches 853 by 480, the actual disk that I've inserted. Okay. Next up. I just want to show you filters. Um, we have deinterlacing. This is all just left default. Um, but what that does, um, because our computers, our devices are progressive scan, so each frame is a full frame. Mm -hmm. Interlaced, the DVD is actually interlaced. So it's only half of the frame per frame. Okay. So, so deinterlacing is going to fix the lines that you see in right. some videos. If you didn't have deinterlacing, you'd have lines through everything, especially during action shots. So just yeah, leave, so those, leave those filters as they are because the defaults are perfect. We do not need to, uh, I don't even know how to say it, detail assign. Because this is if we were upscaling to 30 frames per second, but we want to actually match the 23.98. So just forget about filters. I just wanted to show you that. Okay, leave everything the same as it is, except we want to set a constant bit, uh, frame rate because we know that it is 23.98 frames per second. The default is 30 frames per second. I actually want to match the DVD. So keep in mind, I am not telling you to set this to 23.98 frames per second, or it, it, which is really 23.976. That's the correct option for this particular disk. But every time you insert a disk, you need to observe those top stats so that you know what that disk is. The next disk that I put on in, even if it's from the same set, might be, be 30 frames that per second. That was my question, for yeah. sure. Yes. Yeah, and it does happen. And in okay. fact, with this particular DVD set, once you get to the second, um, second set of discs, it goes up to 30 frames per second. That could be because they were shooting in 24 frames per second and then they switched to 30p right. for NTSC, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, just observe that. So I'm not saying to do this at 23.976 generically. I'm saying observe what the disc is and match that. So sense. I'm creating a copy of this that is so close to the original that you're probably not going to notice the difference. Um, so everything else, so remember, constant frame rate, 23.976 matches 23.98, which is a rounded number. Um, you may have 30 frames per second or 29.97 on different discs, but this disc is that. For a limited time, get your hands on limited edition shirts from the Category 5 TV network. These high quality shirts are manufactured by Teespring, a fundraising website, and your purchase will help support the shows we produce. Get yours today and send us your pictures to be featured on the corresponding show. Visit cat5.tv slash shirts to support us and get your official network shirt today. cat5.tv slash shirts. Now, if you, I mean, chances are you're not going to find that your disc is different than those numbers. But if you do find it's different, are you better to downscale to the closest, closest lower or closest higher? DVDs generally are going to be 24 frames a second. Right. 30 frames a second, 29.97 frames a second. You're not, you're not going to have four frame a second DVDs or... That's a 6,000. Yeah, yeah it, it, there, there are standards, right? And so okay. these, these represent the standards and then some. Like the, here's 60 frames a second, 120 frames a second, 59.94. Right, Depends so on the region. Nailed it all. Yeah, and it will show you here what the frames per second is. That's what we want to match up. Audio, I'm just going to leave as is. Oh, and back here, constant quality, I'm going to leave at 20. If you increase that, it's gonna, the number's going to go down. Um, and you're just going to get a bigger file size, but I, I think 20 is a pretty happy place. You're going to get really good quality without going over the top as far as file size goes. Audio, I'm just going to leave as is, but if there are other audio tracks, you can select them if you want to 
choose a different language, for example. I'm just using the English, and that's all that there is on this DVD. If it has Italian and you would prefer the Italian track, you can actually change that, and that's what will be ripped. You can include both. Um, if there are multiple tracks, you can also include those, and then you can change it using VLC or your player. That's a cool option. Yeah, absolutely. Everything else is just going to stay as is. Those are the key things. So now, save as. I'm just going to browse somewhere on my computer, go onto my desktop. The naming is important, especially if you're using Plex Media Server or some other kind of media server. You've got to start with the season number and the yes. episode number. So S01E01 is the beginning of this yep. file because otherwise it's not going to show up on your Plex Media Server. So mm -hmm. I'm going to call this S01E01 uh, and then I do a hyphen and then I'm going to call this series pilot because that's actually what they call it dot mp4 don't forget to specify that save now i'm not actually doing anything yet what i want to do is i want to add that to my queue now if i look at the queue i can see it's there it's ready to go but i this is episodic remember so now if i was just doing a DV, uh, movie i'm done right i can just rip it <laughs> and i'm done but because this is episodic and there are two episodes on this disc next step is to now pull down the title and change to the next one Episode 2. And I'm going to leave everything as is. It's already using the same f settings that I already set. Uh, but now I don't need to browse. I'm just going to delete the last, the automated file name here and call it S01E02. And the episode number of, ep or the episode name of number 2 for this show is called Whom the Gods Would Destroy. And so back at Handbrake, I'm just going to put that in there or I could type it, dot .mp4. Now, add to my queue. So the specifications would never change episode to episode on the same disc. It would just be disc to disc it might change. The disc itself is a certain frame rate, and is the certain yeah. resolution, but uh, the next disc might be a different frame rate. Right. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it uh, mixed. It could right. technically, I think it could be mixed, okay. but I've never seen it. I just feel like perhaps you'd get lulled into it. Say there was like seven episodes on a disc. You'd sure. get lulled into repeating and repeating. Then you put in a new disc and, well, everything's changed. Yes. yes. Oh, and so you've you got to watch like that. Be yeah. aware. And you see how quick it is to change it anyways and modify those yeah. settings. Exactly. Um, now, if I look at my queue, I have both of those episodes in my queue. All I need to do is hit start queue and pour yourself a coffee, go sit down. It's on my i7 laptop. This is going to take about an hour per episode. So okay, so close to real time. I don't, an hour and a half. I don't know that it's really that specific. It's just okay. that's how long it takes because what it's doing is it's decoding, removing the copy protection, or, or copying the file itself, um, and then encoding to the MP4 format that matches the specifications that I've given it. Right. So then I end up with an MP4 file. Because this is going to take two hours, just before the show, I actually set it up and did exactly this. And so I already have these two episodes ripped, and that's why the disc was already in my drive. I'm just going to close out of this. And if I bring up my folder here where I ripped it, you can see now I've got these two files. And if I click on it, on my computer, there it is. It's a perfect rip. It looks fantastic. It looks perfect and up on my uh, up on my big screen TV it looks wonderful cool and there you go so that is decoded and it works and nice. uh, we're good to go I like this I have a drawer full of DVDs in our entertainment well, unit yeah that I could spend days ripping and we would love to sure. watch these things but we don't have a DVD player anymore yeah so right. they just kind of sit there, and we keep talking about, oh, should we have just sold them off? But now it's like, no, there's some purpose. You can rip them and put them on your Plex Media server. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's absolutely, like, because the, the video is great. The video looks, it's even on my 55-inch TV, the 480p looks fabulous. Mm -hmm. And because I've set the settings as I have, the quality is stellar. Like, there's no, there's no artifacting. There's no, um, the, there's no perceptible loss. It, it looks great. It looks absolutely perfect. So I think that that covers everything that we need to cover for this feature. I hope that you've enjoyed it and learned from it, and I hope that it helps you to be able to move your DVD library into your current setup because I just don't have the setup to play these anymore, but I still buy them. I still support the, the industries that make them, and, uh, and, and I'm happy to do that. And by doing that, I'm paying for it, 
I bought these off of Amazon. Right. I'm not downloading illegal copies of videos. Right. I'm not breaking the law. I'm not um, stealing from the content creators. Right. And, but I still have the same effect of being able to put it on my devices and being able to put it on my Plex Media server or whatever other device that I own that gives me access to that content in a modern kind of way. Nice. Very cool. There's a question from Solbu in the chat room. Um, what if one just wants to rip without changing the encoding? So DVD encoding is hmm. MPEG-2. Right. Now, but keep in mind, um, it has copy protection. Yes. So you will not be able to play those files mm. if you don't go through the process. So part of this is decoding then re-encoding to a format that your devices will be able to play. Right. That's the key thing. Got it. So I, I hope that answers for you. I hope that all of your questions have been answered. If you have any more, please comment below. we got to jump over to the newsroom. All right. All right. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Several U.S. newspapers suffered major printing and delivery disruptions on Saturday following a cyber attack. India will ban e-commerce companies such as Amazon and Walmart-owned Flipkart from selling products in co from companies in which they have an equity interest. The first autonomous freight train network is fully operational, and Elon Musk claims to be on track for a 2026 Mars colony mission and reveals who will be on board the first trips. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. Jeff Weston. Yaman. Yeah, you're building a brand new beautiful website. What? Aren't you? No. Am I? Oh, you're a terrible actor. What? This is where acting comes into play. Oh, I didn't know we were acting. You're supposed to act. Okay, fair enough. All right. yeah, I'm building a really cool website. Are you building a really cool website? Just because Jeff is confused doesn't mean you have to be. Visit cat5.tv slash dreamhost to sign up for unlimited web hosting for your website with unlimited email accounts, MySQL databases, the latest version of PHP, WordPress, and more, and even a free domain name registration. It's less than $6 per month, so sign up today. cat5.tv slash dreamhost. Just quickly before we get into it, oh, I heard that breath. Just want to let you all know that uh, some of the news stories were submitted this week by Roy W. Nash. We nice. hear that he has uh, been doing well, and, uh, and it's so great to receive some emails from him this week. Mm -hmm. uh, and we look forward to updates there, but just thought I'd uh, give you a quick update. So thank you, Roy, and uh, here's to speedy health and a wonderful 2019. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. Several U.S. newspapers suffered major printing and delivery disruptions on Saturday following a cyber attack. The attack led to delayed distribution of the Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, Baltimore Sun, and other titles belonging to Tribune Publishing. The company said it first detected the malware on Friday, which hit papers sharing the same printing plant. The LA Times said the attack is believed to have come from outside the U.S. An anonymous source with knowledge of the attack told the LA Times, we believe the intention of the attack was to disable the infrastructure, more specifically servers, as opposed to looking to steal information. West Coast editions of the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, which share the same production platform in Los Angeles, were also affected. The virus hurt back office systems used to publish and produce the newspapers. Another publication, the Fort Lauderdale Sun Centennial, was also crippled this weekend by a computer virus that shut down production and hampered phone lines, according to a story on its website. A Department of Homeland Security official said in a statement, we are aware of reports of a potential cyber incident affecting several news outlets and are working with our government and industry partners to better understand the situation. Investigators at the Federal Bureau of Investigations were not immediately available for comment. Okay. So that's scary because... And so can... begins the year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you can get in... To the news. Like, uh. I'm eager to hear more about how the attack occurred. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I mean, that can, 
Uh, what you. do you say to that? Uh, that? That we have such a digital connected, I think about newspapers and think about how old school yeah. the, the technology of a newspaper is, and yet they are reliant now as much as we are on the technology that's internet connected and everything right. else. So. Well, and so many news stations, whether it be TV, paper, whatever, they have remote correspondence that mm-hmm. in a lot of cases probably VPN right. to a network. Yep. And so if their network is regularly getting data traffic coming in from outside the network, mm. mm-hmm. I mean, you've got a lot of holes that you need to have protected. And if they are connected stations, say through a network, you know, you hit one, you could potentially hit them all. I mean, mm-hmm. so often they share content and it's like, where is that vulnerability? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, but at the same time, I just kind of go, well, it's another story. Moving on, I'm going to have my coffee. Like, yeah, a little bit. Um, but um, it, it kind of speaks to the, the infrastructure issues that companies have too. Like these are, and these are big companies, but these are old companies. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, has the infrastructure progressed along with the technology? Has the security measures that are in place progressed along with that technology? Mm-hmm. So we have to look at, you know, as, as, you know, maybe the businesses that we work at, grow and evolve into today mm-hmm. you know are the technologies that are in place to protect us against cyber attack are they up to snuff i still feel like a lot of times it's somebody who's just not security conscious it could be one user on the network that clicked on a file in an email right, right. who like, knows right I, I think of those cities that we've heard of in the past that we've covered on the news where suddenly all of their city computers get the oh pay the bitcoin because we've ransomwareed your computer. It's like, yeah. all it took was one person, you know, who just of wasn't course, careful. Yeah. It's true. Mm-hmm. You know, It's scary because you really, you don't know what causes something like that. And like you said, in a situation where people are just constantly putting information in, how do you know when it's malicious? I'm just glad they didn't change the teleprompter and go all Ron Burgundy. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> India will ban e-commerce companies such as Amazon and Walmart-owned Flipkart from selling products from which they, the companies have an equity interest. In a statement, the government also said that the companies will be prevented from entering into exclusive agreements with sellers. The new rules will be applicable from February 1st. The new regulations follow complaints from Indian retailers and traders who say the giant e-commerce companies are using their control over inventory from their affiliates and through exclusive sales agreements to create an unfair marketplace that allows them to sell some products at very low prices. The All India Online Vendors Association in October filed a petition with the Antitrust Body Competition Commission of India alleging that Amazon favors merchants that it partly owns. The lobby group filed a similar petition against Flipkart in May alleging violations of competition rules through preferential treatment for select sellers. The new rules said that services provided to vendors on an e-commerce platform and by that entity's affiliates should be done so at an arm's length and in fair and non-discriminatory manner. New rules will appease small traders and farmers who fear that U.S. companies are making a backdoor entry into India's retail market and could squeeze out small corner shops that dominate Indian retailing. The Confederation of All India Traders, in a statement, said that if the order is implemented in full, then malpractices, predatory pricing policies, and deep discounting by e-commerce players will no longer occur. Amazon India said that it is currently evaluating the new rules, while Flipkart did not immediately respond to a request for comment. I'm on the fence about this one. Uh, you know what? So was I. Yeah. When I saw it, I was like, I, I love the idea of preventing like the big guy going to all the little yes. guys. But at the same time, I think this has gone too far in its response. Like it, here in Canada, we've got um, grocery stores. You can go to their website, purchase your groceries for pickup at the store. Right. It's not right. You know, does that classify as e-commerce? And if you've got a grocery store that now sells their own brand, are they restricted from doing that in in India? If 
if the store was in India. Like, how far does this go? Because when I read the definition of what they're talking about, it's very wide open to just about anything. Yeah. And, I mean, you look at a company like Coca-Cola, who's got a ton of subsidiary companies underneath, but they're all under the same corporate umbrella. It might be four or five times removed, <laughs> but under this rule, they all apply. But what do, what, what's true about that is they have policies in place that you can't have a Pepsi machine next to it. I know, right? <laughs> which is funny. It, it's tough because like, I, I have to look at this one in the perspective of, okay, this is the Indian government protecting the small marketplace. Yeah. Right. But in, in the terminology, it comes across as more like such a controlling... Mm -hmm. Like I think about if I walk into a grocery store and that grocery store has their brand, right. like I'm thinking President's Choice, yes. right? So if I walk in and there, there's the President's Choice ketchup and there's the Heinz, well... They have the lo loss leaders up at the front, all the, pres you, you know, like, who, who's to say that they can't do that? They own the brands because that's their industry. Amazon yeah. has bought companies and invested companies and created companies in order to sell products at a better price. Yeah. Right. I buy some Amazon basic stuff quite often. Yep. Um, and yeah, it, it. It's, it's just the way it is. Yeah. And it's so tough. Sears is out of business. I know. You and it's like they were crushed, but Sears didn't keep up with the technology. And, right. and so in India, I can understand the marketplace is not able to keep up with the technology necessarily, right? There are probably larger companies, definitely are, yep. that can, but the little guys would be done for. Yeah. If Sears can be put out of business. Sure, absolutely. It's uh, This is such a double-edged sword situation. Oh, and I, you're right. I think I'm on the fence. I don't know how. I think it's gone too far, but I like the notion of it. Mm -hmm. oh. It's really tough. And I think it just boils down to this is the time that we are in. Yeah. Because there's a transition that has been occurring for the past three, four years with Amazon becoming the biggest retailer in the world. It is legit how I shop. Absolutely. Yeah. That's it, right? Going to a store, it's like a foreign concept to me now. I don't. <laughs> I do. I, I go to I stores. Like to stores. I, but ugh. a lot of, like Christmas shopping is a perfect example this year um, and last year as well, where most of the stuff, other than stuff for stockings and things like that, yeah. were bought online. Mm -hmm. And most of that through Amazon. Right. I would say like 95% of the gifts I bought this year were from Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you? What are your thoughts on this? We're kind of, I think we're all three on the fence on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Support it. I, I have absolute support for the little guys and I understand that market mentality and we need that. Maybe the government needs to take a different approach and subsidize the marketplace, subsidize the, the little guy. Mm -hmm. and give them incentives to and and capabilities to flourish mm -hmm. if they can't match the prices give them tax breaks i also wonder if part of this is country economics because you look at uh, a country like india and it's such a massive country and not all areas are equal in their wealth distribution mm -hmm. or their consumerism mm -hmm. so maybe there's an element of country specific commerce scenarios that have driven this and so we're looking at it from our perspective it's tough that way yeah and, and not understanding this scenario and so maybe it's just a matter of north american ignorance to right. the true problem I, of it. i do feel that way and but, that's yeah. why like i'm awkward in this whole thing because i don't really know yeah what we're what's not on right. the side of like the yeah. farmers and yeah. Yeah. Are, are you watching our show from india and, and are impacted here by this yeah mm -hmm. Share your thoughts. I, if you have family or loved ones in India, um, what are your thoughts on this particular mm -hmm. um, governance? Yeah. We'd love to hear. I'd love your, your perspective on this. Mm -hmm. The first autonomous freight train network is fully operational. On Friday, major mining corporation Rio Tinto announced that its auto haul autonomous train system in Western Australia had logged more than 1 million kilometers since July. Rio Tinto now calls its fully operational 
autonomous train system, the biggest robot in the world. <laughs> the train system serves 14 mines that deliver to four port terminals. Two mines that are closest to a port terminal will retain human engineers because they are very short lines. The train system took 10 years to build and cost Rio Tinto $916 million U.S. to implement. The trains are remotely monitored by a crew located 1,500 kilometers away in Perth. According to the mining company, the autonomous trains make sure the rails are clear ahead and monitor internal systems as well, checking for faulty wheels or couplers and bringing the train to a complete stop if there's a problem. The autonomous train system will allow Rio Tinto to cut down on the number of stops that the 2.4 kilometer long iron ore hauling trains have to make to change drivers. Prior to the operation of the autonomous train system, the mining company shuttled train drivers 1.5 million kilometers per year due to shift changes. The average return distance of these trains is about 800 kilometers, with the average journey cycle, including loading and dumping, taking about 40 hours. Additionally, the trains will be able to run 6% faster by removing acceleration and braking variations caused by human drivers. Rio Tinto expects that its auto haul system will allow it to increase the region's iron ore production capacity by 20 million tons. That is superb. Wow. That's a neat story. Yeah. That's a big robot. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, I love that that's their comment. It's a big robot. <laughs> Again, this is going to be two-sided because yeah. this is going to mean loss of jobs. Right. Absolutely. But it's going to be an... I feel like you're driving a train for 40... Like, it's a 40-hour trip. You have to be shuttled to and from because they have to do shift changes. I feel like those jobs themselves aren't the ideal job but right? it's not about like, being an, it's about having a job yeah. but I, I mean like you take that mindset you got road construction why can't they just put a little um rotator on the bottom of uh of a stop sign that flips every you know minute and it's blue you know connected to something on the other side then the sign turners have lost their jobs like it's, it's right but I'm thinking that this will allow for things like being the controller like the remote, the remote controller. I, it's like the remote access mm. operator. Do you think that the, being the, the operator's 1,500 kilometers away? Right. And presumably a, a great force of IT well, to thwart any attack on this system. Right. Because that would be my next fear yeah. I, with I mean, something like that. I think you're going to lose one job, you're going to get another job. But it's sure, a different type yeah. of job, different skill set. And the person who's out of work may not be able to get this new job for maybe programming the trains or something. But the concept of it is very neat. It mm -hmm. takes some of that um, bulk, so to speak, out of the workload. Right. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, as, as a computer guy, I mean, your automated software that you've created, uh, I think you remember you're talking about an AI for a while to help with some of your workload. You're talking Which about one, Jeff? Well, but I mean, so some of that bulk of... His name's Jason. He's a real person. Right, okay. <laughs> but I mean, like, there are Hi, Jason. that you, <laughs> you can make that can help. But it's just like, at, at what cost to the Im human impact? Mm -hmm. Right, So that's I, fair. I mean, I get both sides, but I think it's a neat story. I, I just like the fact that they've automated trains. I, I like that they I just do. made it faster because humans break and accelerate oddly. That's interesting too, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 What I want to know though is, are there sensors on it for track runners? Well, it's it, presumably, I mean, it's monitoring things around it. It's mm -hmm. going to have LiDAR. Yeah. <laughs> Got to fit that in once per show. Um, and so it's going to know that there's things moving. And, you know, if there are kangaroos hopping in front of the train, they're going to have to deal with that. Right. Mm -hmm. I just That's hope just that they've addressed that. Sure. Because there's nothing more dis like sad than to hear that there was a, of course, a track of runner course. that led to an incident. Of course. Right. Yeah. Although I will say, if that were to be the case, there isn't a human witness witnessing it now. Just a side note. Mm, I don't think that's the point. Uh, yeah. Nice attempt on putting a lighter spin on it, <laughs> Sasha, but you just made it worse. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Very much <laughs>
<laughs> oh, dear. Elon Musk claims to be on track for a 2026 Mars colony mission and reveals who will be on board for the first trips. Messaging the billionaire on Twitter, a uh, Musk fan asked, how soon will the first gro group go to colonize Mars? And Musk replied, seven to ten years. That's in line with previous estimations from Musk, who has said he hopes to launch missions between 2024 and 2030. Musk also recently admitted that there was a 70% chance he himself would move to Mars. The Tesla boss also replied to another Twitter user who said, I only hope the first wave of explorers will be poets and not real estate developers. Musk's response was that the initial Mars colonization flight would be populated with creatives. Engineers, artists, and creators of all kind. There is so much to build, he said. It's not the first time Musk has suggested that he'll send creative types to space. Back in 2018, Musk revealed that Japanese billionaire art collector Yusaku Mazawa would be the first passenger on board his SpaceX trip to the moon. The 43-year-old entrepreneur didn't reveal how much he'd pay for the trip, but Musk said he has made a significant deposit on the price, which is a significant price. Yusaku told a thrilled conference in California, I thought long and hard how valuable it would be to become the first private passenger to go to the moon. I thought about how this could contribute to world peace. This is my lifelong dream. That mission to the moon doesn't have a launch date yet, but is expected to take place within the next few years. Reaching the moon is a far easier feat than Musk's planned Mars missions. The billionaire recently admitted early travelers have a good chance of dying on the way. <laughs> SpaceX is currently working on a vessel named Starship. It's believed that Starship will be able to make the voyage to Mars with humans on board within the next seven years. SpaceX hopes to eventually create spacefaring civilization which would include Martian colonies populated by humans. Tickets for the trip would cost around a couple hundred thousand dollars according to Musk. Musk however reckons that living on Mars won't be cheery and certainly not a luxury retreat. Your probability of dying on Mars is much higher than on Earth, the billionaire explained. He also said that early Mars colonists would be working non-stop to build the base and this would leave not much time for leisure. And even after doing all this, it's a very harsh environment, he said. And even if you survive the trip to Mars, it's entirely possible that you'll never be able to return to Earth. There's a good chance you die there, Musk warned. He said, you can think, come back, you can come back, but we're not sure. Now, that does sound like an escape hatch for rich people. So. I love this story. On so many levels of stupidity. What? <laughs> I do appreciate his honesty. Yes. That's, well, it's true. Yes. It's a lot of money. I can't believe that it's actually going to happen. Like and you, that soon. You can't believe like you don't believe or you can't believe like, oh my. I'm Partially. I mean, you look at his track record and, you know, he's a visionary, obviously. Sure. But he has the capabilities. He projects... You know, we're, we're, I like to overpromise, uh, underpromise and overperform. Right. Mm -hmm. He He's tends to overpromise and underperform. Right. So it, when he, you know, announces the new Tesla and then it takes several years before it's, you know, beyond the, the day, I, I just don't know that it's going to happen. But so there's, right. there's that doubt because of his track record, but at the right. same time, I know that if anyone can do it, it is Iron Man. I mean, Elon Musk. He did put, <laughs> he did put a Tesla in space. That's true. Yeah. He did. <laughs> I, what I find interesting about this story, though, is the fact that we don't know the long-term impacts of space residency. Sure. I mean, we've had people on the International Space Station for extended periods of time. I mean, look at the, the twins. One was, in, one was an astronaut, one was not. He, uh, the brother came back from space and genetically he has changed from mm -hmm. his brother. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what this is going to mean if it's like, hey, we're going to send you to Mars. You're going to get there in a year and you may never come back. 
what's five years impact from now? I think before we start jumping at Mars, put something on the moon where if things go bad, you're only three days away. As opposed to a well, year away. It sounds away. like that's what he's doing. But at the same time, he's being really a, a downer to his own program by being realistic and honest to say, you know, you can pay to go to Mars. I'll fly you there. You're probably going to die. Well, well but that has nothing to do with his product. That's the environment of space. I mean, that'd be like, hey, we can get you a, a wetsuit that allows you to swim with great white sharks, but there's a risk you could get eaten. That's right. nothing to do with the suit. That's the but shark. this is progress. That is yeah. stupidity. <laughs> There's a, there is a fair chance if you decide to go to Mars, you know you're not coming back. There. Sure. You yeah. know it. Like, you know it. You've in, lived your deep life. Deep in your soul, you know you're not coming back to Earth. <laughs> Even if they say that there's a chance, there is no chance. There is one. There's, you might get to Mars and live on Mars for a blip, but. <laughs> there is one benefit to going to Mars. What is that? You're not going to have to shovel the snow. Yeah, you might. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know. I don't know. Um, just quickly, uh, according to CoinGecko, here's how the crypto market looked as of 1800 hours Eastern time on Wednesday, January the 2nd, 2019. Bitcoin is up, gaining $165.62 US and is uh, presently at $3,855.06. Litecoin, similarly up and going up uh, by $3.83 US, hitting $32.76. Ethereum, likewise, up. $53.34 at $153.30. Remember, three weeks ago, it was at only $99.96. Monero uh, also gaining um, the slighter gain at $51.49 as this week's uh, where it hit. Stellite, uh, looking at the little guys, is also on its way up at $2, uh, not $2, pardon me, I keep doing that, 2.31 ten thousandths of a cent. Wouldn't right. it be neat if Stellite was two dollars? Yeah, I would. would be rich. <laughs> uh, Turtle coin, uh, an even littler gay, 1.24 ten thousandths of a cent, also gaining 0.78 ten thousandths of a cent. Remember um, that cryptocurrency is always changing. The market is always open and it's always volatile. So be careful and be mindful of the, that fact. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. Thank you so much for being here again with us this week. Hope you've enjoyed the show. Happy New Year, and here's to 2019 being awesome for you, your family, your loved ones, and just all around. Looking forward to a great year ahead. Have a great week, everyone. Bye.